young techie students, but it's more just to make sure that our tech is working with them. <laughs> Hi, this is El Ray. Uh, you can't see me. I'm on phone. Hi, Charlene. It's Marianne. Hi, Marianne. Hi, El Ray. We, we can oh, see. Are you the orange square, El Ray? <laughs> That's Thank probably, you. oh, I assumed it was a black square, but I guess it's orange. No, I no, just I wanted to know. Uh, uh, I haven't talked to uh, uh, Kevin yet, uh, but my from the field tonight will be brief, but it was my uh, experience interacting with three Ukrainian beekeepers that helped us out of a horrible mess one year in almonds. <laughs> Sounds interesting. Perfect. So Kat, um, did you email it to me? I just uh, messaged it to you in Zoom. Do you want me to email also? Um, I don't I don't see it in my Zoom. Um, yeah, that's weird. I don't see it. Interesting. Okay. Oh, there, I got it. No, I did get it. Oh. I'm sorry. I got it. I got it. Sure. It, yeah, it, no problem. Yeah, it came uh, <laughs> just a second after you said it. <laughs> All right. Was my audio working, Shirley? Pardon me? My yeah. audio working. Yeah, it sounds good. You sound okay. good. Okay, yeah. okay, good. Hi, Barbara. All right. Do we want to? Yeah. Yeah. I still haven't heard from Kevin. He's just probably having fun, but a little warning would have been nice, <laughs> <laughs> but no worries. So um, we usually start the meeting off with um, a welcome to our speakers, Jessica Webb and Atreya Manas Manaswi. Did I get that right? Aha. Sorry, having trouble with some unmuting. Yeah, that's right. I try my best. <laughs> okay, good, good. <laughs> and then we want to go to uh, any new members. Is there anybody who's, uh, it's their first time here tonight? If you could just introduce yourself and tell us, uh, you know, who you are, uh, where you're from, and whether or not you have bees. So just jump in. I, I can't see the whole. I, I, just unmute yourself. Yeah. Oh, hi, I'm Paulina. Hi, Paulina. Hi, Paulina. And um, I am new. Sorry, I am almost home, so I don't have my video on, but I am new and I have uh, inherited a swarm of bees in my compost and I uh, showed up at the Valley Hive yesterday for a class and I was being mentored today by Steve Savage with his new queen and I'm just super excited uh, to be part of the new, of, of this bee community. Thank you. That's awesome. We're happy yeah. to have you. And thanks, Steve, for, for mentoring her. And yeah, that's a big Super job. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. thank you so much. All right. Looking forward to working with you. Um, is it Abigail? Jump in next. I'm Abigail. I'm from Altadena. And I do not have bees yet, but I am taking classes with Keith at the Valley Hive. And so I'm in my second month of taking classes with him right now. And I'm looking forward to getting a hive and all of that stuff started coming this spring. So just trying to absorb as much information as I can before that happens. Awesome. There's a lot of great beekeepers in Altadena. So you're yeah. in a, a great area to have bees. And you're in good hands with uh, with Keith. He's 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 the man. He knows everything. Well, if he doesn't, he'll find out for you. <laughs> yeah, that's what it seems like. Cool. Awesome. Good. Um, yeah, you're, so you're from the ter you're from the territory where Charlie Cougar had a column in uh, one of the uh, National Bee magazines for years and years and years, and he was from Altadena. Talked about all of his experiences there. Oh well, that's awesome to know. Looking forward to experiencing that myself soon yeah awesome we're excited for you too um is there anyone else who's new tonight uh, i'm new tonight and awesome. my name's rod i have two hives one i got from valley hive and i've gone through keith's 
class and I still attend his Saturday calls and he's, I consider him my mentor and uh, it's going really well and it's a very exciting journey and I'm happy to be here tonight. Awesome. And where are you located, Rod? I'm in Agora Hills. Oh, okay. So a little ways out there. That's awesome. Great. Well, welcome. Yeah. Thanks. Good. Uh, anyone else? Okay, not hearing any voices or I seeing any hands raised. So where, I, where we're going to go. Pa where did Pauline say, Paulina say she was from? Woodland Hills, I think. Yes, I'm in Woodland Hills. Yeah, so she's out not far from where Steve is, Steve Savage. Yeah. Awesome. Woodland Hills, close to Calabasas. Awesome. Great. There's a lot of great beekeepers out that way, too. Um, okay, so tonight we have two speakers. Uh, they're going to share the share the time, and we're going to start with Atreya just because he's I, he's on the, you know, he's going to tell us where he is, but he's on the east coast somewhere, not not out here. So he's a couple hours ahead. It's probably nine o'clock for him right now, and he probably has school tomorrow. So we'll start <laughs> with uh, with Atreya. He's going to talk about uh, small hive beetles and how to control them. And then uh, he'll do his presentation and then we'll ask him some questions. And then we'll go on to uh, Jessica Webb who works with Dr. Boris Baer at uh, UC Riverside where all the action was happening on the weekend with the, uh, the cyber conference. Uh, Jessica is gonna talk about um, Nozima, Nozima Serrani, which is the, uh, sorry, that's my phone ringing. Um, Anyway, Jessica will introduce herself and talk about uh, her research. Uh, we're looking forward to both both talks. So um, without any further ado, uh, Atreya, are you ready to roll? Yeah, I'm ready to rock and roll. I'm going to share awesome. my screen. Okay. Okay, so hopefully you can all see uh, the slide rack I have pulled up. I confirm. Yeah. Okay, that's good. Nice. All right. So um, thank you for the warm introduction. Uh, my name is Atreya Manasli. I'm a 10th grade student at Orlando Science High School here in, Orla uh, in Orlando, Florida. And I am in Eastern time, so it's 10 p.m. here and I do have school tomorrow. Uh, so I'm gonna be speaking on small hive beetle biology and control with you all tonight. And I'm affiliated with the University of Florida and the US Department of Agriculture where I'm mentored by Dr. Jamie Ellis at the Honeybee Lab and also Dr. Charles Stahl at uh, the Center for Medical Agricultural and Veterinary Entomology. So I'd like to break down how I'm going to be presenting. So there's gonna be two main points that I'm gonna be focusing on. The first of which being the biology of the small hive beetle, the background, the life cycle and its proliferation, and then also some behavioral characteristics. The second aspect of the presentation will be the treatments. So I'll be discussing chemical-based treatment methods and then also organic-based treatment methods, which is what my research that I did and what I'll be sharing with you focused on. So let's dive into it. Uh, Athena Tamida is the scientific name for the hive beetle. And the beetles were actually native to Sub-Saharan Africa uh, prior to the 1990s. However, they made their way through ship uh, into the United States in a port city in North Carolina in 1996. And the first reports came out of my state uh, in Florida in 1998. So since then, it's spread all across the globe, wreaking significant negative impacts on the global beekeeping industry. As you know, here in the States, we have a very large migratory beekeeping operation with two thirds of all of our colonies going to California each year for almond pollination itself. So it's just a, uh, a fest for all of these different pests and pathogens to spread from one hive to another. And these beetles are often described as opportunistic scavengers and they're pretty smart predators of the honeybee. They destroy honey and pollen stores and they damage cabins and comb and this can significantly stress the colony. As I'm going to mention later, uh, it's mainly the larvae of the hive beetle that are the root cause for all of this damage. So this is the life cycle for the small hive beetle. Uh, I'd like to focus on these four stages. So this first stage is the egg stage. And so it takes two to four days once the female beetle has laid eggs for them to hatch. And then they will hatch into these larvae. So these are really the problem. These larvae will go around throughout the hive and they'll consume the cappings, the comb, the honey, and then also baby bees sometimes. 
And this will take seven to 10 days for them to mature fully. Once they mature, they'll crawl outside of the hive and then actually pupate in the soil in the vicinity of the hive. And so this is a dug up pupae, an image of that. It takes three to six weeks for them to develop from this larval stage to this pupil stage. And then after that three to six period, week period, they'll emerge and in the next 24 to 48 hours, they'll develop that reddish brown hue as adults. So something I'd like to show you here is just some quick math. You can see the life cycle um, here of this beetle is 24 weeks, that's the lifespan. And completing this life cycle from an egg going to an adult, it's two days, seven days, and three weeks. And this is assuming good conditions. It's roughly this two plus seven is one week plus this other uh, third week is about four weeks from this egg stage to this adult stage. And four times six is 24. So that's important because at any given point with good reproduction conditions, you can have six consecutive generations of beetles within a hive at any given point in time. So it really goes to show that if these beetle infestations are not controlled, they can quickly get out of hand. And something I'd like to add with these females is they have these ovipositors in the back and you can actually sex the females by squeezing on their abdomen and a long appendage will shoot out that's an ovipositor. So this is like an egg laying machine gun and she can go throughout the hive and cracks and crevices and deposit these eggs. In a single lifetime, a female can lay anywhere from 1,000 to 2,000 eggs upwards. So it can really get bad if you're not maintaining your high beetle populations. Now, as I mentioned, the larvae are the root cause for the damage. The center image shows a very bad hive beetle infestation. And these larvae appear very suddenly and in large numbers, often in the hundreds or thousands. Something interesting to note here is that there is a yeast in the feces of these larvae that causes fermentation of the pollen in the honey. So as these larvae are moving their way through the hives, they'll actually defecate in the honey and also the pollen. And this causes a yeast to be released this yeast is called Kadama omeri here on the left. And so when this yeast reacts with that pollen or that honey, it causes this fermentation. And this fermentation causes the release of this alarm pheromone of the honeybee known as isoamyl acetate. And so what this alarm pheromone does is it serves as basically a calling signal for small hive beetles in the vicinity of that hive on the outside to come here uh, and be attracted as if this is some sort of calling signal and there's a source of food here. So that's what it does. Basically, when there's already an infestation, it will call more beetles from outside the hive, which is very interesting. And once these larvae uh, infest the hives significantly, uh, brood rearing will seize entirely and the population will dwindle. This is termed a slime out. Sometimes the bees will just completely abscond from the hive uh, and leave the hive uh, in and of itself. So there's two telltale signs of a sufficiently bad larval infestation in a honeybee hive. The first thing being that when you pop open the lid on the super, you'll smell a rotting citrus odor. And the second thing being that honey will start bleeding out from the front of the hive. And unfortunately at these two stages, there's not much that can be done to actually control for these hive beetles. The infestation has reached a significantly bad level. I'd like to discuss this interesting thing. I'd like to share it with you. Uh, it's called the, there's no, scientific name for it, but essentially these bees will jail beetles inside cracks and crevices in the hive and corner them into these spots. So they will patrol them there and keep them in the jail cells. So you have guard bees that will do this. And something interesting to note here is this image on the bottom right shows a beetle actually interacting with a honeybee here. So what's happening is that the beetle is using its antennae and antenating against the mandibles of the honeybee. This is interesting because once that beetle starts antenating with the honeybee on its mandibles, it causes the honeybee to regurgitate food and sort of feed the hive beetle. Uh, and the bee is tricked into thinking that the beetle is actually a bee. So this doesn't occur very frequently, only about 10% of the time. The other 90% of the bees are fooled uh, and it kicks out the hive beetle, but this is something cool. Now, good apiary practices for small hive beetle infestations are as follows. So when combining or exchanging the comb or the frames between the hive, you must be careful because you can actually introduce hive beetle eggs that are in that comb or those frames from outside colonies into that colony. Also, when removing old frames or supers, uh, it's important to not use rotten, cracked, damaged, or dilapidated comb or frames because these make for very good hiding spots and also spots for female beetles to deposit the eggs. And when they deposit the eggs in these cracks and crevices, 
and the bees cannot access them. And so you have uh, larvae that are going to become um, a relevant problem in the hive as soon as they hatch. Now, another thing is when pulling honey from the colonies, it's important to extract quickly, preferably within the first two days. Because if you leave the honey inside those frames, then the bees will, uh, the beetles will ultimately consume the wax cappings and start defecating in the honey, rendering it unsuitable uh, for consumption. Another easy thing to do for managing hive beetles is exposing your hives to sunlight. So hive beetles do not like the sun. Uh, the bees are not as irritated by it, uh, but they will get a little bit feisty if you start opening up the hive. However, it is effective for controlling the hive beetles as they're repelled by the sun. Uh, the last thing on this list is with nukes. So, and this also applies for when you're adding new frames or adding supers. So when adding new frames or supers, specifically to nukes or weaker hives, if you add more than the colony can actually take, you'll be leaving more room for these hive beetles to go unpatrolled. When there's, um, when there's less supers and less frames, and according to how big the colony is, it's easier for these bees to patrol, obviously, and maintain the hive beetle populations in the hives. So that's something you should note. Now, I'd like to begin with the second part of this presentation, uh, where I'm going to be sharing my research on organic treatments. I'm going to begin with these chemical treatments and then discuss the organic agents. So for the chemical treatments, there's pretty much two main uh, agents that are used for hive beetles. The first of which being check mite. This is comophose strips, which you may have heard of or used. These are placed flat in the hive with cardboard for hive beetles. You can also use these to treat for varroa mites. This has 10% comophose. And the image on the right here is guard star. So this is permethrin soil drench. And so um, looking at this image, this is the life cycle of the hive beetle. And so you can see that the uh, permethrin is applied during the pupation stage as, as a soil drench, um, and it actually kills the beetles during that period. And then when the beetles are adults, the comophose is applied as a strip. And so when these beetles come in contact with the strip, they'll actually die inside the hive. And um, moving on to the non-chemical or organic Hi, biological. Hello? <laughs> Somebody have a question? Okay, I'm not sure if somebody uh, unmuted there. Uh, if you have a question, I, I, I muted them. Okay. Yep. Thank you. Uh, if you do have any questions and uh, you don't want to save them for the end, please feel free to interrupt. I'm happy to answer them. So for these non-chemical and organic or biological treatments, you have apple cider or any other uh, sort of attractant that's used. It could be apple cider or oils that you find commercially or even mineral oil or vegetable oil. So these are placed inside these in-hive traps. And so they serve as attractants essentially. So uh, once you place these traps inside the hive, the beetles are actually lured by the odor of these agents and then they drown in the solution. These slits on the top are big enough so that only the beetles are able to enter inside. This is a DIY trap or a baseboard trap, any other sort of trap um, that you can use with an attractive mechanism. Um, you can use these liquid treatments in that and uh, it'll work. Another agent that you can use is diatomaceous earth. So you can place this in the vicinity of the hive and this will actually dry out the cuticle of the small hive beetle uh, and it'll cause it to die. So this last image is a nematode. So these nematodes are entomopathogenic, meaning that once they're introduced into the soil, they actually make their way inside the gut of the small hive beetle, and then they feed on um, the gut and they eventually cause the beetle to die. So this is a schematic with the advantages of the chemical agents, the disadvantages of the chemical agents, and then also the advantages of using the organic treatment solution that I propose, which I'll get into. So the advantages of using these pre-existing chemical treatment methods is that one, they're highly effective, and then two, that they show very fast results. Uh, the second thing is the disadvantages. So there are quite a few, the first of which being that they can become extremely unaffordable, especially at the commercial scale. Um, this year, I'm actually running a trial with Comophos and just buying that treatment strip, which sometimes isn't even available with shipping costs can become extremely expensive if you have a lot of hives. Another thing is that it poses a risk of soil, water and environmental contamination. Um, and it ultimately makes its way into the honey and many different hive products such as the propolis, the wax, the honey, the royal jelly. In fact, uh, recent studies have found large traces of chemical residues inside these hive products. 
Another major uh, concern is the health risks that it poses to wildlife, aquatic organisms, the honeybees themselves, and then also humans. If you look at the uh, directions and the guides on the back of these chemical treatments, it always says to use these gloves. It has uh, different directions on there. So it can be risky using these, uh, especially in long term without safe practices. Uh, now, my proposed organic treatment solution is affordable and sustainable. It was also shown to be effective for hive beetle capture. It's environmentally friendly, naturally biodegradable, and it poses no risk to wildlife, aquatic life, humans, or honeybees themselves. So my research can be broken down into two main phases. The first phase, or year one, was when I tested seven organic and inexpensive small hive beetle treatments in a field trial. The second year was a follow-up to the first year's study. <clears throat> this is a phase two project. And so here we developed a novel treatment based on beer, which was found to be the most attractive treatment of those seven organic agents from year one. And so phase two was basically making a refinement of beer. Now let's dive into phase one. So this study looked at seven organic agents, apple cider vinegar, which was the control because a lot of beekeepers use this commonly, mango puree with boric acid, cantaloupe puree with boric acid, yeast, peanut oil, grapeseed oil, and beer. You may be wondering, these agents seem to be out of the blue, why they were picked. They were actually chosen because based on prior study findings, this beetle has been shown to uh, be attracted to and also reproduce on tree sap, rotting fruits, and other such odorous compounds. And so based on those hypotheses, these chemical or these agents were chosen, these organic agents. Uh, so this image on the bottom right shows the beetle blaster trap. This is a mini version, the six inch. In here, you can see cantaloupe puree with the boric acid. This is a 2% concentration. And these black specks are the hive beetles that have been captured inside this treatment. So these are some pictures from my field trial. The image on the left here uh, is of me in a beekeeping suit. You may be thinking, what a responsible young beekeeper, but that's totally incorrect. In the field, I got stung dozens and dozens of times. Uh, in fact, so many times on my legs and my arms, I remember it so vividly. Uh, it really taught me a lot about beekeeping and also being in the field where it was hot and humid. The working conditions are sometimes simply unbearable. So it really opened my eyes about the beekeeping industry and the work and the dedication it takes to put food onto our plates as beekeepers. Uh, this image on the bottom right shows beer. And so these black specks again are the hive beetles that have been captured inside this solution. So once these beetles actually enter the solution, they drown in it. Um, and they're attracted first. So how I ran this trial was by using these beetle blaster traps, they would be filled with solution about halfway, 10 milliliters, it's the sweet spot, enough so that the beetles actually detect that the compound is in it, but they, there's enough so that they actually fall in. If you fill it up higher, sometimes the beetles can actually take a sip and then leave and not drown in the solution. So I ran this trial for the first year on 24 different colonies with these seven treatments over a six week period. Uh, so this was a very extensive field trial. And each week I would put in new traps and then I would extract old traps and then I would do weekly beetle counts. And so this image in the middle shows me counting beetles in my mother's kitchen. So this was actually during the pandemic in 2020. My mother wasn't all that fond of this idea, but we'd often have beetles in the household uh, zooming around. So I take fishnets in hand, trying to capture them with my brother. Uh, we still might have beetles loose in our house till this day, we'll never know. So after all of that extensive data collection and tabulation, I ran some statistical tests. So I'm not going to zone in too much on these, but the only important thing here is these green arrows. So this is a T-test that was drawn on the samples. So this T-test essentially is comparing apple cider, which is the baseline treatment in this study, the positive control, and comparing it against the other treatments that were tested, well, one-on-one -on -one basically between apple cider and another treatment. So this column shows apple cider being tested against the mango, apple cider against the cantaloupe, apple cider against the yeast, and so on and so forth. So what we're paying attention to here is these green arrows again. And so for each of these columns that has a green arrow, that treatment was significantly different from apple cider. What I mean by significantly different is 
The treatment with green here was shown to be much better than apple cider vinegar in its beetle capture. So it captured more beetles. So this means that mango mix captured more beetles than apple cider, cantaloupe captured more, yeast captured more, and beer captured more. Whereas the peanut oil, the grapeseed oil, and then the control, which was just a blank trap, these three treatments did not capture uh, significantly more than apple cider. So it was these four in green that were of interest. Now I followed this up with a, something called an ANOVA test. So the T-test showed us when apple cider was compared against another treatment, if that treatment was better than apple cider, but that's a one-on-one -on -one essentially. The ANOVA compares all of the treatments against one another to see if there's actually one group that's much better than all of the other groups to say that something is significantly different from the rest of the treatments. And so what we're looking for here is a significant difference in this result. And so a significant difference was shown in the ANOVA test result. So that mean it, it means uh, it meant at least one group was significantly different from the rest of the groups, but we didn't know which group. So this was followed up with another test. And this test showed that beer was by far the most effective treatment for small hive beetle capture. And this was a very rigorous way to judge the data set for one particularly significant treatment. Now, moving away from the world of statistics and all of those numbers, we can look at this graphically. So this is the Pareto chart. You can essentially see these bars here and there's something interesting here called the Pareto line. It has an interesting principle associated with it. But what's really a focus here is of beer. So beer here is in deep blue. And um, you can see apple cider, which is the control. That's here in light, uh, in this color of blue. So beer has 198 beetles captured throughout the course of the study. Cantaloupe has 135, uh, peanut has 116. So these are all of the total counts throughout the course of the six weeks. Uh, you can see beer is a lot higher than any of the other treatments. But the other thing to notice here is this orange line. So the phenomena associated with this is called the 80-20 rule. This red circle here shows the data that we're gonna look at. So this data in this red circle Essentially, 20% of the data in that red circle accounts for 80% of the entire population of hive beetles captured throughout the course of the study. So to reiterate, 20% of these three treatments accounts for 80% of all the beetles captured. So that really goes to show how effective these treatments were. Now let's look at the box and whisker plot, another graphical representation. The X is really what's important here, this X in the circle. So beer here again is in deep blue. This X signifies the mean. So the mean uh, correlates with the consistency of the beetle capture throughout the course of the experiment. This X here in deep blue is much higher than any of the other Xs for the treatments. And this means that beetle had a much higher consistency for the beetle capture throughout the course of the six week study. Ultimately, what I concluded from this phase one trial was that beer was by far much more effective, 33 times more effective, in fact, than apple cider vinegar. And it was the best treatment by a far margin. Moreover, beer costs five cents per hive on average, and it's also widely and easily available. Uh, beer does also not harm the bees. You will not get drunk bees using beer inside your hives. Uh, it will only kill these beetles. Now, if you don't believe what I said about beer being cheap, uh, this is just an image from walmart.com. I pulled it up. I use Miller High Life beer, and this was used. It's a lager beer. This was used because it's inexpensive and readily available. It's 7.3 cents per fluid ounce. Now, compare this to apple cider vinegar. This is also from walmart.com. It's 19.8 cents per fluid ounce. You can see the drastic difference in cost here. Beer is almost three times cheaper and it was also shown to be 33 times more effective for hive beetle capture. Now, moving on to phase two. And so this was uh, the treatment that was essentially invented based on beer's chemical composition. So in this study, I was essentially creating a refinement of beer in the form of a more concentrated solution. So as you may know, beer is 90 to 95% water. And so the uh, other chemicals in beer are actually very diluted. So this was creating a refinement based on the same ratios that are present in beer, but essentially concentrating them in the form of a new blend. And so the goals for this project were to make this blend even cheaper and more effective than beer itself. So let's explore how this actually happened. 
so the first step in this process was extracting the chemicals from the beer. So you can see this matrix, this is the beer bottle. And so this is a vacuum attached to a pump here. And so this tube is connected to this filament and this filament is pulling the compounds from this beer bottle into that filament and they're being trapped. Uh, so once this vacuum is turned on, the air is pulled and then those uh, molecules in the air are trapped inside that filament, that white filament. And so after they're collected, they're placed inside this machine known as a GCMS or gas chromatography mass spectrum. And so this instrument analyzes the chemical composition uh, of the compound that's being run through it. And so there's two main things to know about this. There's a coil inside this GCMS through which the chemical compounds run through. It's about 10 meters to 100 meters in length. And there's also a detector at the end of this coil. So when these compounds run through this coil, they're actually separated based on their molecular weight. So the lighter compounds travel faster through the column and the heavier compounds slow down and don't travel as fast. The lighter compounds are then, uh, they reach the end of the column more quickly and therefore they're picked up by the detector. So I say that to say because after that process, the GC presents a reading. So this reading here is a sample on the right. These uh, peaks designate a chemical that's been identified here. So each of these peaks is a chemical and the chemicals, uh, the peaks, I should say on the left were really what were a focus in this study. You may ask why, and that's because the lighter compounds showed up on the left. And this is important because they're carried more easily in the air. What does this mean? Well, it means that these compounds are carried more easily in the air and thus picked up first by the beetle compared to the heavier compounds, which aren't carried as easily in the air. And so these chemicals that are lighter in weight are called volatile compounds. Now, um, four chemicals were chosen, uh, four volatile compounds were chosen based on these readings from multiple graphs. And then they were tested uh, through an EAG or electroantenography. So there's three principal things to this setup here. And I should add that the EAG is basically where the antenna of the hive beetle is taken, placed onto an electrode, and then the antenna is exposed to chemical compounds, and then the response of that antenna to the chemical is picked up by a computer, and then a reading is generated, which can be analyzed. So this filter paper here with this red arrow has been dipped inside that individual volatile compound that's being tested in this trial. And the red arrow here on the top left shows the antenna that's been placed onto the electrode. I should add that these antenna are actually very hard to remove from the hive beetles. These beetles are merely five millimeters, 10 millimeters in length. So it's almost like neurosurgery, but on hive beetles. It's very fun and tricky. So after this chemical compound is placed here, there's a foot pedal attached to this tube. And when it's pressed, air is pushed through this tube. It's, on, uh, it's pushed through the uh, filter paper and then it catches that chemical compound and then it's released onto this antenna which picks up the response and then the computer amplifies the reading and you can read that signal and see whether it's positive or negative. Uh, this picture on the right here shows a blend that was used. So after this uh, testing, this EAG, there were two blends that were created in the laboratory and then two other treatments that were used and I'll elaborate on that on the next slide. So this is a very high beetle population that's been captured here. All of these black specks are actually beetles. This is in the hundreds. So after all that data collection, again, I won't dive into the statistics, but a lot of uh, extensive analysis was run. And uh, after all of this analysis, the oil blend treatment was shown to be the most effective by far. So this is the Pareto chart, we can analyze this. The oil blend here, which is what the statistics showed were the most effective, has a beetle capture of 620 compared to the oil blend, uh, oil water blend, which is 269 and then beer and then the control. So these two were the, uh, the blends that were created in the lab. They were both more effective than beer and the control, but the oil blend was much more effective than any of the other treatments. And again, applying that 80-20 rule, you can see 20% of the oil blend makes up for practically 80% of the entire population. My conclusions from this phase two trial were that the oil blend treatment was extremely effective by a far margin. It was shown to be five times more effective than beer, seven times more expensive, uh, it, seven times more effective than the control that was used, which is the mineral oil. And it was also shown to be half as expensive as the beer. So now why should you use my findings and how should you use them? Uh, this beer does not harm your bees. You will not get drunk bees again. 
Beer can be used in any sort of in-hive trap that's placed in the hive, and it can be used as an attractant interchangeably. Uh, beer is also very cost effective. And so compared to apple cider, it costs nearly 7.3 cents compared to 19.8, which is a third of the cost. Now, the key takeaways for this, my uh, some key tips for small hive beetle management that I'd suggest are firstly to keep uh, good apiary practices, practice cleanliness, uh, keeping your hives in sunlight, and then also being careful with how many supers you're adding, things like that. The second thing is using treatments to control your hive beetle infestations, whether that ultimately be chemical or organic treatment agents. And ultimately, it's the synergy of these two that releases beetle populations to a low manageable level. There's really no silver bullet method for this, uh, but using both of these can help manage beetle populations. So these are some resources for small hive beetle management. Um, this is one from UF, uh, and this is another one. These are both PDFs that you can look at to get information on hive beetles. And this last link is the UF Honeybee Lab. Uh, this has good information. I can share this uh, with Mr. Warren, and if you'd like to circulate that, uh, you guys can take a look at this. It's pretty helpful. Um, and so I'm open to questions now. Yay, we have uh, Ruth, has, Ruth has stepped up to uh, take a look at the questions for you. Hi there, uh, Atreya. I just want to commend you on an amazing presentation. We are all, uh, uh, we're just, we don't know what to say. It's uh, really impressive. And uh, we do have a few questions here. Uh, let's see. Uh, one person asked in the beginning when you were talking about the fruit, fruit, fruit puree, I think that was cantaloupe, mm -hmm. um, to boric acid. So there are two questions here. One is, what is the ratio of the fruit puree to the boric acid? And the second question is, is the boric acid an attractant or is that supposed to just kill? the beetle? That's a great question. Thank you. Um, so the boric acid is actually used in a 2% concentration. So it's the cantaloupe that's actually the attractant, but the cantaloupe itself doesn't really kill the hive beetles. So that boric acid is used as the killing mechanism. Great. Okay. Thank you. Um, the next question was about filling up the hive beetle traps, the beetle blasters with uh, the liquid and um, you mentioned, I think you said there's a sweet spot for how full they should be, like 10, uh, 10 milliliters. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so true? yes, yes ma'am. So generally you wanna fill these to about halfway. If you're using the larger beetle blaster traps, I'm not sure what the exact specification is, uh, but for the smaller ones, it's about 10 milliliters. Halfway is really used because it's just enough so that the beetles will pick up what's actually in the trap, but it's not so much that the beetles can take a sip out of it um, and then just leave. They actually have to fall in and interact with that, and then they die in the solution. So I'd also like to ask you if you've ever had the beer or any other liquid evaporate completely between inspections. That was right. one of the concerns we were talking about um, about this climate that we have here in Southern mm -hmm. California. It's very right. hot. And yeah, being in Florida, especially here, I've tested this during the summer uh, for weeks at a time. And so it generally lasts a good two or three weeks. And then after that time period, you can see declines and it will evaporate, especially with something like beer uh, that has so much water in it. Uh, but I'll actually, I'll add this as well, uh, because you may be wondering, I spoke on the oil blend that I created, and you may be wondering, well, how can we get our hands on that? So exactly. I'm going to be sharing with you. Yeah. So uh, the beer actually does evaporate pretty quickly. And so the reason uh, the oil blend formulation is actually a 50-50. So 50% 50 of that is actually the formulation used in beer, and the other 50 is actually soybean oil. So soybean oil is an example of one fixed oil. And so these evaporate, it takes a very long time for them to evaporate, weeks, months, sometimes years. And so the oil blend stays in the trap for weeks and months at a time. Now I'm currently in the stage of still developing that. Uh, something very interesting I'd like to do if your beekeepers are up for it is trying to do trials. Uh, so I'd be happy to send this out and see uh, if the beekeepers are open to testing it in their hives with the beetle blaster traps and seeing how it does there, seeing what the beetle capture is like. 
So that'd be something yeah. very interesting to I do. I see people shaking their heads. Yes, so maybe you can um, get with Warren after the meeting and uh, uh, let us know like what address, if we're going to write to you to ask mm -hmm. to be included in the trials or how that will work. Definitely, yeah. I'd be happy to share information on that. I'll just coordinate with my mentor about that and develop some sort of system, but I'd be happy to do that. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Okay, so yeah, the oil blend. That's what everybody wants to know. What the <laughs> I guess it's proprietary. <laughs> yeah, it's actually going through um, the publication right now. So it's going through publication in a peer-reviewed manuscript. Um, so once that is released, then the formulation will be public. Uh, but right now at this stage, uh, it's not at that point. Okay, great. Uh, Oh, yeah. So I had a question about when you were talking about the oil blend and how you made it with the chemical extraction of the components of the beer. You said that the oil blend with the beer is actually half as expensive as beer. Mm -hmm. How can that be? Did you right. factor in the all that equipment you needed to remove the chemical components from the beer? Mm -hmm. Itself. Yeah, so this was just um, this was just the cost of the chemicals itself to create this treatment. Um, once you actually get your hands on the chemical, it's not very expensive to make. Uh, the plan for this is it's basically taking uh, pipetting and taking these different uh, solutions and mixing them together. So this could be done with even a syringe if you're trying to build this. If you're trying to make this solution on a large scale, you just uh, according to that recipe. Um, it's in the microliters as of yet, but if you wanted to make this in a larger batch, you could just draw up some of the solution and uh, mix it together, and there wouldn't be any other costs associated with that, really. So it's just the uh, the solution that I was discussing there. And in addition to that, the beer, the price of the beer that I quoted is actually with uh, the commercial manufacturing and everything. So that's not just for the solution. Um, so that was just a comparison of the solution versus the, the price of the beer itself. Um, Got it. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, so let's see. Leon is asking if you could put those two uh, websites back up on the screen again. Absolutely. Uh, also, Jeremy has his hand up too. Okay. Great. Uh, so... I just I just wanted to ask about um, I would assume you're going to catch more hive beetles in hives that have more hive beetles in them. So how do you control for the number of hive beetles in your hive relative to what type of attractant that you're using inside the hive? Thank you. That's a great question. So obviously, like with the Varroa, you can sample beforehand and try and estimate the population with sugar shaking or you can use uh, alcohol or something like that. But with the hive beetles, it's not actually possible to see, uh, like preempt what the population is. So to account for that, you can use randomization, which is what I use in all of my trials. So say you have uh, 10 beetles in this hive in the first week and you put beer in there, and then you have 100 beetles in the second hive and you put the oil blend in that hive with uh, a higher beetle population. You'll obviously be getting more beetles in the hive that has 100 beetles. Um, so to account for that, a week after you can rotate through the hives. And so there is some bias with that. Uh, that's inevitable in the case of honeybees with the hives, but over the course of six weeks and using 24 different colonies, the likelihood that that happens for each and every colony is very low, especially with that randomization and the beetles reproducing throughout the course of that study. Um, so randomization is really the way that I did it. And I also used statistical tests, uh, a multitude of them to try and analyze for this and see what was actually effective. Um, Great, thank so you. I hope that, uh-huh. Yeah, I have one other question, sorry. Um, I was wondering, have you ever tried putting like a bowl of beer in an empty super on the top of the hive? I actually have not tried that, I haven't. That would be something really cool to do and see. I, you'd it be exposing that directly to the sun. I'm not sure how long that would last, but that would be no, something would really be cool inside to see the how super. long. The, oh, inside the super. Huh. Yeah. No, An I have not tried super. that. Or like uh, under a, a, in a spacer, you know, under the cover. Uh -huh. Yeah, that'd be something really cool to see. Uh, and I, 
when you mentioned uh, the bowl, I was thinking on top because another thing you could test is seeing not just from inside the hive, but outside the hive, how many beetles are actually coming into that. But doing it inside in an empty super is also something really cool to consider. I haven't thought about that. I'll look into that. <laughs> Me too. Thank you. <laughs> I nominate you. <laughs> So um, do you know anything about <clears throat> taking uh, fly traps and putting a solution in there uh, uh, externally, uh, like 20 feet away from your hives to attract the hive beetles? Um, I have not looked into that. I, my mentor was actually doing some, uh, my mentor over at the USDA was actually doing some research with designing a trap that can be placed outside of the hive and you put a sort of solution in there and see how many beetles you get. I haven't experimented with that. I'm not too familiar with the external traps um, because the mechanism is definitely different compared to inside the hive. You're just trying to capture those beetles that are already there, but from outside, you're trying to lure beetles from outside the hive uh, into that trap. So the tricky thing with that is actually that, and one of the reasons that the beetles actually come inside the hive is these beetles belong to a class known as Nidadulidae. That's their order. Um, and so they've been fundamentally shown to feed and reproduce on tree sap rotting fruits and other such things in the wild. So they're attracted to the honeybee colonies because of the smell of the pollen and the honey. Um, so I'm going off tangent a little bit, sorry for that, but no, I haven't looked into that. I yeah, can that, definitely- no, I, uh, um, There was uh, yeah, can, uh, some research in, in Australia and i am just started um, you know, doing some experiments with uh, yeast and, um, and honey right right in a, in a, uh, in a fly trap uh -huh. if you'd share your contact information sir in the chat or uh, private message it i'd be happy to look at some things uh if you could just mention what it's about and get some resources for you did your observations agree with your statistics yes sir so looking at the uh the graphs generally speaking from what I saw in the graphs and then also the statistics, they did conform with one another. And I was seeing the same thing, which was a good sign. The numbers and also the, the, the visuals were agreeing with one another. So yes. That's not, that's not quite my question. My question was when you looked in the hives or when you looked in your traps, did the results and the number of dead beetles sort of match your statistics over? Oh, yes, sir. Yes. So generally speaking, I was seeing a lot more beetles in the oil blend in the beer compared to the other treatments. Sometimes I'm seeing almost four, five times, six times as many beetles in the beer as I am seeing in the controls. So there was definitely a difference throughout the course of the entire study. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Okay. So Atreya, that was an amazing presentation. Very impressive. Um, I think we need to um, have you back at some time in the future and uh, we'd be happy to have you again. And uh, yeah, I think that's all the questions that we have time for right now. Um, Atreya, you're welcome to stay on if you like, or uh, you're welcome or, to- uh, Or hit the sack. To hit the sack and get ready for school tomorrow. And Warren, do you want to add anything else before Atreya um, leaves us? Warren, are you there? Warren, Carl? Yeah, I'm here. Um, it was a fantastic uh, presentation. It was all and more that I, that I'd hoped for. And uh, you know, this uh, Atreya, you have a, a bright future ahead of you in science. And uh, we'll be calling you uh, doctor here one of these days soon. <laughs> Thank you so much. I'm so happy to come back. Uh, I know there's a lot of questions. I'm very sorry I didn't get to in the chat. I'm going to share my email in the chat. If you'd like to just email me, awesome. um, I'll be happy to reply. I right on. Thank okay. you so much. Yeah, I, have one Thank last, you. I have one last question here. What, uh, what's your estimate of what percentage of the hive beetles in the hive are killed off uh, with your methods? Hmm, that's a very interesting question. I can't sample for the, the hive beetles that are actually in the hive at the beginning. So there's no good way to estimate. Some people do say that you can look at the, the, the lid and see how many beetles are crawling around, but that's not really a good indication of how many are in the whole hive. So to be honest, I don't have a good answer for you. I'm not sure. Um, yet, you don't have a good yet. answer yet. Atreya. Yeah, it's a good answer yet. <laughs> okay, that's a thank good you question. so much. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you.
And Jessica, I believe I have you already as a co-host, right? And Warren, I sort of, I jumped the gun at the beginning of the meeting by introducing Atreya. I, sh I should have let you do that, but I was, you know, I was uh, caught off guard that Kevin wasn't here. So would you like to introduce Jessica? Sure. I, I was ready to go with, with Atreya. So <clears throat> yeah. our Thank next guest speaker that. is Jessica Webb. Jessica is originally from Memphis, Tennessee and is currently a PhD student at UC Riverside in the entomology department under the guidance of Dr. Boris Baer. She is a member of the Cyber Unit uh, Center for Integrative Bee Research, where she conducts uh, her research activities. <clears throat> I had the opportunity to meet Jessica Webb last Saturday at uh, the UC Riverside are at UC Riverside during their uh, 2022 Bee Health Conference. She gave us a tour of her laboratory facilities where she does some of her research. Jessica is, Jessica is currently researching the honeybee disease Nosema serrana in hopes of developing a novel treatment. She will be sharing with us some of the insights and discoveries she has made into the into understanding Nozema. Uh, like before, the questions will be submitted uh, via Zoom chat uh, feature and following your presentation uh, uh, for your uh, and read to you for your reply. Welcome, Jessica Webb. Uh, it's a pleasure to have you here, and the floor is yours. All right. <laughs> That's what I have. <laughs> Welcome. Thank you. Let me share my screen with you guys. All right. Okay. So, do you guys see the presenter view? Yep. Yeah, that was perfect. Yeah. Okay. Yep. Perfect. Okay. Um. So. Today, I will be presenting a bit of my thesis work, but I did want to start with a bit of an introduction with my to myself. Oh. Okay, yeah. As Car uh, Warren said, uh, I am from Memphis, Tennessee. So the question gets brought up often, how did you get into entomology, right? If you look at Memphis, it is a city, so there's not a ton of, you know, you know, you got plenty of buildings, but not a ton of insects. Um, but oddly enough, I was always interested in insects from a really young age. Uh, so it just kind of makes sense. Oh, uh, I did my bachelor's um from Jackson State University it's a small HBCU in Jackson Mississippi where oddly enough instead of entomology I actually majored in optometry I thought I wanted to be an eye doctor for a while turns out that was not the case uh I went and shadowed some optometrists and I was like man this is a terribly boring job I would hate to do this for my entire life I really hope there are no optometrists on the call right now. Um, so after a while, I took some classes, one being zoology. And the guy that taught it, um, his uh, research specialty was actually marine biology. So I got in touch with him and we started working on some research together. So when you think of marine biology, you think, yeah, you got these beautiful corals and dolphins and sea turtles. And, you know, that's the type of research that I thought I would be doing. Uh, but there was one thing wrong with my logic. Couldn't actually swim. So I got to do none of that fun stuff. I was actually working with these guys that are called sand fleas. Uh, sometimes you might hear them called amphipods. Um, but they're these really weird little gross guys that live in the sand on your beaches. Um, I was looking at how different um, parameters in the environment, such as even beach restorations, played a role in their um, community and abundance. I was also doing some genomic work with these guys. 
um, trying to sequence their entire uh, genome. And I kind of hated it. Not the research itself, but I thought that these little guys were terrible and gross. Uh, so I started looking for other opportunities because I did really love research, um, but I didn't think that marine biology was for me. So I did what's called an REU, which stands for Research Experience for Undergrad, Undergrads. And they give you a chance to go out to a different university and perform different research. Um, so I got a chance to visit a really big name school in the Midwest where I was performing uh, research around native bees. You guys have to excuse my voice. I've been talking all day and all weekend. So, so I was working with native bees and we were looking at how prairie restorations, um, how different seed mixes in these prairie restorations actually affected native bee communities um, as well as native butterflies, native wasps, and you know, all your native pollinators. And again, I really love the bees. I really love doing this research. But one thing that I didn't like is that when I first started, the question that I had was, well, why we're looking at these native